Good evening, dear doctors. Good evening, dear doctors. Today we are going to conduct another clinical episode on our XP Connect webinar education series powered by Versana Technology from GE Healthcare. Today we have a pioneer in the field of diagnostics, someone who needs no introduction. Please welcome Dr. TLN Praveen, Director, Abhishek Institute of Imagology, Hyderabad. Dr. Praveen is the President Elect of Society of Fetal Medicine. He is not only passionate about teaching, but also an avid runner and hiker. There are many awards to his credit and has delivered lectures at various national and international forums. Before we get started, due to current pandemic, uh, there has been a huge traffic load on internet services. If you experience temporary interruption in the transmission, kindly bear with us. We will sort it out immediately and resume. I now welcome Sir to address our viewers with his clinical talk on color Doppler, an essential diagnostic tool in gynecological practice. Welcome to Sir. Yeah, just one second. I just share the screen. Yeah, sure, sir. Yeah, can you see see me? Can I? Can you see see my screen? Yes, sir. Yeah, sir, it is visible. Yeah, yes, yes, sir. Very clearly, nice. sir. Right. Good evening, everybody. Um, uh, hope everyone is doing well and staying safe. I would like to thank uh, GE for giving me this opportunity to talk on color Doppler as an essential diagnostic tool in gynecological practice. Now, the modern day gynecological practice is basically integrated with ultrasound. Ultrasound is part and parcel of gynecological examination and uh, it is usually done by using what is called as the endocavity approach. A uh, transabdominal approach is the other approach that is available, but then whenever we try to evaluate the pelvic viscera, it's always uh, better to use an endocavity approach rather than a transabdominal. The reason being that whenever we try to use an endocavity approach, we try to use higher frequency transducers with uh, closer proximity of evaluation. And not only that, there are two most important factors that we are going to achieve by using an endocavity ultrasound is that we can assess the tenderness of the lesion as well as the mobility of the lesion, which are two most important factors in evaluating various uh, pelvic viscera abnormalities. Now, in addition to it, now we have what is the color Doppler as well as the spectral Doppler, which also helps us in assessing the blood flow in the pelvic viscera. Uh, so the transvaginal color Doppler is an exciting imaging modality in the evaluation of angiogenesis in reproductive pathophysiology. This is one of the most important things that have been added to our uh, uh, armamentarium in evaluating uh, various pelvic pathologies or pelvic abnormality. Now, how are we going to go about it? We are going to go about it taking certain factors into consideration. One of the most important factors uh, is that we try to evaluate or identify the presence or absence of the blood flow. That is one. Two is increased or decreased blood flow. Three is to differentiate between pathological and physiological neovascularity and also try to identify the vascularity in benign as well as in malignant conditions. There are certain newer additions that have come into practice that is such as the 3D power angio. Slow flow. Slow flow is one of the best uh, software that are now available and it is extremely useful in evaluating particularly the uh, capillary and organ perfusion which, which has really revolutionized uh, imaging of uh, small vessels and low flow areas. Now, contrast enhanced ultrasound is one more uh, factor that we earn, one more uh, um, tool that is available with us in order to evaluate the vascularity of a particular pelvic lesion. Now, sorry. I think there is some hang up here. Sorry, I think there is some hold up here. Yeah, okay. Now, before we go into the clinical applications of uh, ultrasound or color Doppler, 
we need to understand about angiogenesis. What is this angiogenesis? Angiogenesis is nothing but a formation of new blood vessels, which is also known as neovascularity. And uh, how does this happen? This neovascularity or angiogenesis, how does this happen? This happens either by formation of new vessels or by activating quiescent vasculature to produce new blood vessels. Not only that, the tumor cells have a feature or a character of uh, secreting what is called as the angiogenic factor, which also results in angiogenesis. Similarly, the ovarian tissue induces angiogenesis by secreting prostaglandins, which in turn are being, uh, uh, is being secreted because of a uh, luteinizing hormone. So these are the various ways by which the angiogenesis takes place. Uh, then we have Now we need to uh, understand and differentiate between normal vasculature and abnormal vasculature. There are certain features which are very, very characteristic to uh, particularly when you have an abnormal vasculature. The features are that the, usually the vessels will have varied caliber. As you can see in this uh, microscopic image as well as the slow flow demonstrated here, we can see that the vessels have got uh, certain areas are narrow, certain areas are grossly dilated that sort of varied caliber will be there. Not only that, the most of the, the vessels can be elongated or sometimes you can even see some coiled structures. Then another important thing is normally whenever you have a normal branching of a vessel, it is usually dichotomous, whereas these vessels do not follow that pattern and they can uh, in, give, give, give rise to three or four branches at a time. Not only that, as a normal vessel, when it reaches the periphery, it gets thinner and thinner. Whereas the neovascularized vessel or abnormal vessel or a pathological vessel will not have decrease in the caliber. It is also associated with incomplete vascular wall. This I will explain you in my next slide. At the same time, they are quite often associated with arteriovenous communications or shunts. Uh, then. Now, when we talk about the vascular morphology, as we all know, when you take the cross section of a vessel, what we have is the intima. This is the intima. Immediately above the intima, you find the muscular lining. This muscular lining is the one which is extremely important because it is the one which regulates the elasticity of the vessel. In a, in a tumoral vessel or a neovascularized vessel, what happens is this muscular lining will be lacking which results in low impedance. So for example, you have, this is the normal vessel where you can see that, uh, where you can see the intima as well as the, the, the muscular, uh, muscular lining. And whenever you do the spectral waveform, you find a good, uh, since uh, the peak systolic velocity and then the diastolic flow. Whereas whenever there is thinning of the muscular lining, as you can see here, the spectral waveform also varies in which you have very little peak systolic velocity and a good diastolic component. Whenever there is complete disappearance of the muscular wall, that means absolute lack of elasticity in the vessel, then it results in a continuous onward flow, which is basically a diastolic flow. So these are the various things that happen as far as the vascular morphology is concerned in a neovascularized vessel. Then comes the there is some hold up here. I'm not able to understand why. Now, once after understanding this vascular morphology, the most important aspect of using color doppler in evaluating pelvic viscera is to have proper settings, uh, machine settings. The reason is that we need to set our uh, uh, color doppler properly so that we all know that the pelvic vasculature is a low flow vasculature. So in order to cope up with that, you need to properly set your machine. First and foremost thing is you try to identify the area of interest on grayscale. Once it is identified, then you take a large color box and using this large color box, then gradually reduce the size of the color box so that it, it, uh, it uh, 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 focuses only on the area of interest. And once that is done, then you need to reduce the color box properly so that a small color box improves, improves the frame rates as well as the pulse repetition rates. 
not only that this improves the detection of a low flow which is characteristic of velvet glass cartridge so that is the reason why you always need to have a small color box which will in two ways it will be helpful that is one is that it increases the frame rate so that the resolution will not drop down two is that it increases the pulse reputation rates so that you can identify the low flow areas now what are the various settings that we need to uh, be aware of uh, and your uh, familiarity with your mission knobs is extremely important in order to properly set your mission. First and foremost thing is the filtration. We need to use low filters as the low filters are, are the settings which are used for low flow patterns and particularly flow in the pelvic vessels and veins are low flow and it helps in assessing the tissue perfusion also that is one. Second thing is the persistence. Color persistence should be moderate color persistence. The velocity range, the velocity range depends on the vessel you are interrogating and because the flow in the vessel or the velocity of flow in the vessel is what is important which decides the velocity range which you are going to, array, uh, to use. Uh, particularly when we take the velocity in the pelvic veins, it is almost about 10 centimeters per second whereas in the pelvic arteries and the peak systolic velocity is 10 to 50 centimeters. So quite often the velocity range which we use is about, about 3 to 6 centimeters per second. Then whenever tr we try to interrogate the vessel by using a spectral drip, uh, Doppler where we need to identify the angle of insulation. The angle of insulation should always be less than 90 degrees because the PI and RI are angle independent but the peak systolic velocity is angle dependent. Now another important factor is using a small gate, sample gate. That is whenever you try to sample a vessel the gate should actually appropriately fit into the vessel which you are interrogating as the pelvic vessels which we are interrogating are very small and so you what you need is a small gate so that you can visualize I mean you can sample the vessel properly then most important thing is the pulse repetitive frequency should always be about 6 or but some people use 0.3 and I usually use 0.6 so these are the various uh, mission settings that we have to be aware of and we have to be familiar of. Then comes the spectral waveform. Once you have identified or visualized the vasculature of a particular structure, then the flow impedance is assessed basically by taking into consideration the PI, that is the pulse stability index and the resistive index. The pelvic vessels are very tiny in caliber and they are tortuous. That is the reason why quantitatively to assess the amount of flow that is taking place in this becomes very very difficult because there will be a lot of superimposition between normal and abnormal vessels that is the reason why we try to subjectively evaluate the flow pattern taking into consideration what is called as the color scores when once you take the color scores these are color scores are subjective ones when if you want to objectivize the color scores or the flow pattern then we need to use what is called as the 3D power Doppler and this 3D power Doppler is useful in assessing the perfusion indices such as the vascularization index VI which tells us the number of color voxels in the region of interrogation. That is very very important. So when you want to assess the amount of voxels, the color voxels that are present in a particular area where which you are interrogating then we need to get what is called as the vascularization index and to get the color values of all the voxels which are seen in the area of interest we give we get what is called as the vascularization flow index so these are the two objective parameters which can help us in assessing the amount of flow now coming to the clinical applications uh, first and foremost thing the commonest clinical application which we try to use in our day to day practice is uh, patients referred to us with abnormal uterine bleeding FIGO has come up with a wonderful classification of various causes which are responsible for abnormal uterine bleeding. They have coined what term which is called as the palm coin in which the palm group of the causes are very discrete that is the polyps, adenomyosis, leomyoma and malignancy. They are discrete, they are structural which can be measured and evaluated by imaging techniques whereas the coin component of the causes are entities which are not defined by imaging techniques that is non-structural like coagulopathy, ovarian, uh, ov ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial, uh, uh, iatrogenic and, uh, and there are certain things where it is not yet classified. So these are the various things that we have to keep in mind. Now let us start off with the various components of uh, uh, abnormal uterine bleeding. One of the most commonest com thing that which we come across in our day-to-day -day practice is the endometrial polyps. 
uh, when we take the endometrial polyps, it accounts to abnormal uterine bleeding in almost about 39% of the uh, premenopausal women and 21 to 28% of postmenopausal women. Uh, first and foremost thing that we try to confirm the, uh, the, the morphological appearance of a polyp by doing a 2D with saline infusion sonography or sometimes you can even couple it with a 3D, uh, 3D saline infusion sonography so that it confirms the presence of uh, uh, endometrial polyp. And once you have done that, by putting the color doctor on, what we can see is this sort of a feeding vessel. See this, this is a feeding vessel which you can see very nicely. Okay, uh, I think this video, oh, yeah. This is the feeding vessel which you can see. Once you have a feeding vessel like it, which is known as the, the pedicle artery sign. This is the pedicle artery sign. Once you can demonstrate a pedicle artery sign, you are more than sure that what you are dealing with, the abnormality within the uterine cavity is basically a polyp and that will confirm the diagnosis in almost 100% of the times. The next common cause which can result in abnormal uterine bleeding is the adenomyosis. Uh, adenomyosis basically on grayscale, we very easily diagnose by finding what is called as the asymmetric enlargement of the uterus, presence of myometrial cysts, and at the same time, the obliteration of uh, the endomyometrial junction. And m m not only that, uh, what we have is what is called as the rain in the forest appearance. Now, when once you put the color doppler on, what we find is that there will be increased, uh, increased vascularity. So you can see that there will be an increased number of penetrating vessels, tumorous or tortuous vessels throughout the involved area. So this is very, very typical of an adenomyosis. But Whenever we have a focal problem, that is the adenomyoma, morphologically it is usually ill-defined, that is one. Second is that there will be mixed echogenicity and there will not be any mass effect at the same time, no calcifications. Now we have, well, when once you put the color doppler on, what we find on color doppler is that we find that there will be intratumoral vessels. So that is very characteristic of an adenomyoma. Coming to leomyoma, the characteristic grayscale uh, uh, features of leomyoma is that it is usually a well-defined lesion and it has a mass effect. At the same time, quite often you do find some calcifications in them. When, when closely related to the endomyoma, it displaces the one, displaces the junctional zone. Once you put the color doppler on, you find this sort of a skirting vessels. These are the very characteristic skirting vessels which you find in a, in a leomyoma you don't find intratumoral or intralesional vascularity in leomyoma. So this is the, this is the most important characteristic feature in differentiating between a leomyoma and an adenomyoma. Now, uh, the, not only that, when you put the color doppler on, the most important thing is it is very extremely useful to differentiate or identify the size and location of the myoma. At the same time, uh, it also helps in what is called as umbilical artery embolization, that is by identifying the predominant side of the blood, blood supply. That is, when you take this as uh, spectral sampling, you find that there will be lower RI and higher PSV or EVV on that side of the, uh, the supply vessel. So once you find that one, it, it is really helpful to do a uterine artery embolization. Not only that, hypervascular fibroids respond better to uh, uterine artery embolization. So these are the features that we have to keep in mind while differentiating between an adenomyoma and a leomyoma. Uh, and color doppler helps in not only differentiating between the two, but also helps in actually localizing the lesion, assessing the size at the same time, the dominant vascular supply can be identified, which is greatly useful in, 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 in utilizing uh, management by uh, umbilical artery embolization. Next important, uh, factor that we have to keep in mind is the clinical problem which we keep in mind is the leomyosarcoma. Morphologically, it has almost similar features as that of the leomyoma, but only thing is on CD, on color doppler, we find that there will be intraluminal vessels, intratumoral vessels, as you can see here, and these tumoral vessels have, have a characteristic neovascular identity as I have demonstrated to you. This is the slow flow uh, pattern that you can see. This is the power doppler in which you can see varying calibers of the vessels, tortuous vessels, elongated vessels. I mean, uh, the bifurcation is almost obliterated. I mean, the normal um, 
bifurcation pattern is not seen and then the terminal vessels are not having reduced caliber. Not only that, these intratumoral vessels will have decreased resistive index as well as the pulsatility index and at the same time there will be increased peak systolic velocity. So these are the features which are very characteristic of a leomyoma or leomyosarcoma. Now coming to endometrial cancers which is again one of the most important things that we have to be very cautious about and we have to identify them as early as possible. Whenever we try to evaluate the endometrial abnormalities, the features which we depend upon are the quantitative assessment of the endometrial thickness, that is assessing the endometrial thickness, then the qualitative that is the morphology or echogenicity of the endometrium, third one is the endometrial midline echo and distortion of the endometrial midline echo which is usually a linear echo uh, will also give you an information regarding the endometrial abnormalities and sometimes there will be obliteration of the endomyometrial junction at the same time color and power doppler are extremely useful because on color scores uh, which is subject to we can identify the abnormal vascularity of the endometrium which can indicate to us the possibility of a malignancy and we can also identify the vascular by different types of vascular pattern. Now these are the color scores that can be used, used in evaluating the color flow in, in the endometrium. Whenever you put the color Doppler and when you don't find any flow, you call it as color score 1. When you find minimal vascularity, you call it as color score 2. Moderate, color score 3 and abundant, we call it as color score uh, 4. Now another thing which we have to keep in is not only that, we can see on ultrasound as we can, as we can see here, when you put the color, color box on, uh, you can see that there is no color flow in this particular area, so it is color score 1. Whereas here, you can find that there is minimal color score, minimal flow, and which is suggestive of minimal flow, and a moderate flow, and at the same time, the abundant flow. So these are the various examples, subjectivity, which we can characterize or differentiate between the color scores, uh, and which will tell us about the vascularity of the endometrial lesion. Then comes the vascular pattern. The vascular pattern can be very varying. One, it can be having a single dominant vessel without branching. Two, it can have a single dominant vessel with branching. Sometimes there may be multiple dominant vessels from focal origin. Sometimes there can be multiple dominant vessels from multiple origin. Sometimes the vascular pattern can be scattered. Circular flow as you can see in the adenomyoma, uh, sorry, in, in the fibroids. And so, so irregular branching when you see whenever there is an irregular uh, growths in the endometrium and color splash is one more feature which we have to keep in mind. Now, these are the examples of a single blood vessel with branching, multiple focal areas, multiple global vascularity and then we have what is called as the scattered vessels as you can see here. Then we have the, the, the scattered vessels as well as the circular pattern which you can identify put, put, putting the color doctor on. Now, Whenever you find this sort of a pedicle artery sign or the feeding vessel sign, which I have already described as far as the polyp is, polyp is concerned, once you have identified this sort of a flow pattern, you are very sure that you are dealing with a polyp, not with a malignant growth of the endometrium. Now, the other features of cancer is that the endometrial thickness will be more than 5 millimeters. So you need to couple or uh, use these features along with the vascular pattern, which we have already identified either as a color score or the vascular pattern to come to a conclusion or the diagnosis of a uh, endometrial cancer. Quite often what we find is that the endometrial thickness is more than 5 millimeters. It will be hyper or so what we said already is that you depend on the quantitative assessment, qualitative assessment and then the uh, endometrial junction. So the endometrial thickness should be more than 5 millimeters. It will be hyper or mixed echoic endometrium and irregular interrupted endometrial junction multiple densely packed large irregular branching vessels are the ones which you quite often find them with high score color score that is color score 3 or 4 where we find abundant vascularity and saline infusion sonography shows an irregular surface. So these are the various features which you have to keep in mind. There have been a flow chart that has been designed where once you can see this sort of a global enlargement or global endometrial thickness then what we do is we do a simple endometrial biopsy and which can give you an uh, answer or in case if, the, if this simple endometrial biopsy is inconclusive, then we need to follow it up with uh, what is called as the uh, hysteroscopic uh, the sampling. Uh, I think there is again a problem which I will delete. It's getting hung. It's 
sorry sorry i think there is some problem with my laptop i think uh shall i again come back i think there is some problem i'm i'm getting a hold up here yeah that's okay sir that's yeah sorry i'm sorry extremely sorry that's okay sir I just again come back one second. Yeah, okay. Can you see my screen? Hello, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can see, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. The first yeah. slide, sir. Yeah, I, I'm Yes. Okay. So uh, I think I'll switch off my video so that I think uh, that is, uh, I don't know because. Uh, how, how to switch off my video is here. Yeah, okay. Uh, so what, what happens is that whenever you have this sort of a global thickening of the endometrium, you need to do a, a, a simple endometrial biopsy. In case if it fails or the sample is insufficient, then we need to do what is called as diagnostic hysteroscopy. Whereas whenever you find a lesion, which is actually having endometrial thickness. As a, when you put the color Doppler on and when you find there is increased vascularity, then you need to think in terms of uh, doing an operative hysteroscopy. Now, there are situations where the endometrial thickness is more than five millimeters or unmeasurable. As you can see in this particular image, it's an unmeasurable endometrial thickness. And in that situation, what we need to do is, we need to put, a, put the color Doppler on and find the feeding vessels. Once the feeding vessels are done, then you do a simple endometrial biopsy. And if this simple endometrial biopsy is inconclusive, then what we need to do is again, oh, uh, then we need to do what is called as the diagnostic stroke. So this is the flow chart that is available in order to identify the various, uh, uh, I mean, to categorize these uh, endometrial malignancies. Now, there is one more interesting thing that we have to always keep in mind is what is called as the, the invasion. Particularly whenever you find the endometrial malignancies, we need to be bothered about the myometrial as well as the cervical invasion. Now, when we have this sort of an invasion, you can see that this is the tumor. This is the graphic representation of the tumor within the endometrial cavity. And once that cavity is seen, and then you can see, put the color Doppler on, you can even visualize the spiral arteries here. And these color Doppler, you can see that there is invasion into the myometrium. This is the myometrial tumor serosal diameter. And whenever you find the extension into this, not only that, you can also see the vessels going into the cervical stroma. So by color Doppler, we can stage the malignancy, you can grade the malignancy and assess the exact tumor size also. 
So based on these things, you can risk stratify the endometrial cancers. So you can risk stratify the endometrial cancers based on various factors, like there are nine parameters that you can take into consideration, which will help us in uh, identifying the possibility of an endometrial cancer. That is taking the BMI, endometrial thickness, vascularity. Whenever you have multiple vessels like this, the possibility of a score will be more than four. And whenever you have a score which is more than four, then you need to think in terms of a possible uh, endometrial cancer. So that's how you st risk stratify it. Now coming to the uh, adnexal lesions, whenever there is an adnexal lesion, the presence of a solid component in an adnexal lesion is highly suggestive of possibility of a malignancy. When you put the color Doppler on and when you find that there is abundant vascularity in the lesion, then it is a, uh, there is a high suggestion of uh, malignancy. Now, again, the vascularity of the adnexal lesions is assessed by a subjective method, which again the color score uh, ranging from no flow of one and significant uh, strong flow is uh, four. So these are the various examples of uh, vascular pattern. This is color score one where you don't find the vascularity. A, a moderate amount of vessels are seen here, which is color score two. And uh, um, 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 this is minimal, this is moderate, and you have abundant, which is color score four. So these are the various color scores that are available in order to assess the vascular pattern. The latest developments that have taken place and a lot of research is being done is the virtual 3D angiographic sampling. Now this will really help us in, um, uh, in predicting the ovarian cancers uh, in the visualized mass. So you have a mass which is a cystic, cystic mass along with it sometimes you do find some uh, solid components when you put the color doppler on and find that there is vascularity sampling that particular vascularity and trying to assess the uh, uh, the vascularization index as well as the flow index one can come to a conclusion of uh, the possibility of a malignancy now another important thing is the vessel density again you can assess the vessel density you take the the vocal as well as they take the, the rendered mode where you can assess the vessel density and that gives us the vi fi as well as the bfi vi is nothing but the vascular index fi is nothing but the flow index and the the uh, the vfi is the vascularization flow index so these are the various things that we have to keep in mind now coming to the application of color doppler in ectopic the presence of color uh, or, or vascularization, demonstration of vascularization by color doctor is not pathognomonic of ectopic pregnancy. This is one important statement that you have to always remember. The presence of uh, vascularity which is demonstrated by color doctor is basically because of the trophoblastic flow which is there. You take any of these uh, ectopics, that is, this is the tubal ectopic where you can find that there is a trophoblastic flow which is abundant vascularity. Similarly, this is an ovarian malignant, uh, ovarian ectopic pregnancy where you have a ring-like uh, uh, appearance and cervical pregnancy where the trophoblastic flow is lighted up because of the color Doppler. And this is the scar pregnancy where the uh, trophoblastic flow is identified. This is the intramural ectopic pregnancy where you can find the trophoblastic. This is confirmatory in the sense you find a, a morphological feature of a gestational sac or a yolk sac and presence of a, the abundant vascularity which tells us that there is a trophoblastic flow. So whereas when you have a quite common presentation of a tubal ectopic is that you find a mass like a heterogeneous mass where you put the color doppler on, you have an abundant scattered vascularity which is extremely typical of an ectopic pregnancy. You not always see a gestational sac with a fetal node, but you just see a mass and you find that there is abundant vascularity, then you know that you are dealing with an ectopic pregnancy. Another important application, whereas as a complication of uh, what you do in these uh, conservative management of ectopic pregnancy is to give system, uh, systemic methotrexate and this can result in marrow depression as well as uh, myometrial pseudoaneurysms. Pseudo this is a classical case where you can find that uh, there is a, uh, the cystic area within the, uh, the myometrium and this cystic area shows a, a turbulent flow and on color doctor, you can confirm the diagnosis of a pseudo aneurysm. This I have borrowed from one of my students, that is uh, Dr. Upasana. Thank you for this slide. And now coming to the pelvic congestion syndrome. Pelvic congestion syndrome is a clinical presentation where a lady presents with chronic pain, pelvic pain, uh, quite often um, uh, heaviness in the pelvis and uh, discomfort, constant discomfort in the pelvis as well as the lower limbs and you put the color doppler on 
and the Doppler provides dynamic information regarding the venous blood flow and the criteria to diagnose pelvic condition syndrome is that you find dilated ovarian veins which are more than 4 millimeters in diameter there will be dilated tortuous uh, arcuate veins in the myometrium so ovarian veins are dilated the myometrial veins are dilated pelvic viscera pelvic veins are also dilated and the you know, flow is definitely the the venous flow is more than 3 centimeters per second so this is the classical a grayscale imaging where you find lakes of vessels and you put the color doppler on in the ovary you find that this sort of a, a vascular pattern and in the myometrium you find abundant vascularity which is very typical of a pelvic condition syndrome now as i said you not only use color doppler in identifying the present the the vascularity but also the absence of vascularity is an important clue in identifying torsion of ovary now whenever you don't find a flow within the affected ovary you need to think in terms of torsion but then remember quite often you may not find that because the arterial flow can be demonstrated because of uh, as the torsion could have been involving only the venous as well as the lymphatic components whereas not only that the ovary has got a dual arterial supply so compression of one vessel may not cause a complete uh, uh, avascular ovary so that is one thing which we have to keep in mind more than finding an avascular ovary it is important to find the adnexal torsion in which what you find is rounded hyperechoic mass with multiple concentric hypoechoic uh, stripes now when you put the color doppler on on this sort of a mass uh, adnexal torsion mass then what you find is that you will find a circular revealed circular as well as coiled twisted vessels which is called as the wilfu sign which is highly suggestive of an adnexal torsion so this is a classical example where you find an ovary which is definitely enlarged not only that it is enlarged you find sorry uh, not only that it is enlarged but also you can find that there are uh, certain uh, prominently displayed follicles which are extremely characteristic which is what is called as the follicular rim sign and then you find what is called sorry uh, uh, okay uh, then you find when you put the color doppler on uh, you find this sort of a uh, hyperechoic mass not only that there is a hyperechoic mass you find concentric hyper and hypoechoic areas as you can see here and these areas are very typical and when you put the color doppler on you find that there will be a, a loop of vessels which are seen uh, in these hypoechoic areas so this is a char characteristic feature of a uh, what do you call it as a willful sign i don't know this video is giving trouble i think anyway let me go to the next slide So your screen is no. I know. Well, no, no. I'll I'll come back again. Yes, sir. Once. Yes, sir. Yeah. No, you you cannot see my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now we can see. Yeah. Uh, it's blank. Well, yeah, blank. I know. Uh, why is it blank? I don't know. It's hanging quite often, I don't know why. No, I think I have to come back again. Yeah, okay, sir. Sorry, I'm very sorry. I don't know why this is happening. Uh, yes, sir, but I anyway, I'll see whether it is possible to get back to that. Yes, sir. No issue, sir. There's connection error, I guess. Uh, I think so. There is some problem there. No problem, sir. Please come back, okay? Yeah.
Yeah, I guess there's a technical issue. So, sir, we will resume back in five minutes. I think sir is logging in again. So, really sorry for the inconvenience. Please bear with us. Yeah, can you see this now? Now the screen is seen. Is the screen visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's visible, sir. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, the next important thing is the color doppler in infertility. This is one area where uh, really ultrasound has made a great uh, uh, impact uh, in evaluating this uh, infertile couple. Now, whenever we try to evaluate this infertile couple, the basic problem is that we need to evaluate various uh, factors such as the uterine anomalies. Uh, which we have, we, which particularly we evaluating the septal or subseptal abnormalities of the uterus can be evaluated and the management strategies can be planned. Not only that, the intrauterine pathologies which we have already discussed, such as the polyps as well as the fibroids, adenomas can be evaluated by using color Doppler. Then, to some extent, the tubal patency can also be used, so it can also be assessed, which I will show you as I take you through the lecture. And then ovarian follicular monitoring is one area where there has been a, a, a enormous development that has happened. And then the polycystic ovaries, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which is questionable. And then the assessment of the endometrial receptivity and male infertility, which is not in the purview of today's talk. So these are the things that we are going to discuss with it. Now, whenever we try to evaluate the infertile couple, there are three most important stages that we are going to uh, go through. One is the pre-ovulatory follicular assessment. The second one is the assessment or monitoring of the ovulation. The third one is the implantation and timing of the embryo transfer. These are the three most important things that we have to keep in mind. Now, before going into that detail, we need to understand a little bit about the uh, ovary ovulation and the color Doppler, where whenever we try to use the color Doppler in monitoring the fetal growth and rupture, as well as the formation of the corp early corpus luteum, uh, color Doppler has a, a very important role to play. This is marked by drop in the blood flow impedance. That is, whenever there is a good follicle formation, then what happens is the impedance of the ovarian vessel vascularity will come down. That is, the RINPA will be reduced of the intra-ovarian intra vessels during late follicular as well as the luteal phases. These are two most important statements that you have to remember. The second and the third most important thing is there will be a sequential increase in the follicular rim vascularity. This is an extremely important thing that the follicular rim vascularity will increase. And this actually from, from the time where there is an LH uh, surge and its peak and just prior to the follicular rupture, the formation of the corpus luteum, there will be a, a, a increased um, follicular rim vascularity. As you can see here, 